Running between the wickets is a vital part of batsmanship. You've just seen a prime example of how not to do it. Let's see if they can do it correctly this time. OK, well, you've just seen him do it correctly. That was very good. Davidson is called early, sent Jonty back, and Jonty's got back easily. So that's the key to running between the wickets. Call in quickly. Let's have a look at the points we need to avoid. Jonty has started running before calling. And the biggest crime, both players are ball watching. In this example in test cricket, you can see both batsmen are ball watching. The batsman at the striker's end has decided there is no run. The non-striker has decided he can get in. But the level of communication is nil. Result, run out. In this example, Jonty has called early, communicated as they crossed, got low to gain maximum reach, and slid his bat over the line to ensure the run is completed. While Dave Richardson, now facing the ball, has called for the second and Jonty slides his bat in, a prerequisite of running between the wickets. There are only three calls, and this is what they mean. Jonty, you're the next man in. Do you get nervous? Of course I do. Um, I think everyone does get nervous to a degree. It's quite important to be able to, I think, use your nerves, control it, and channel it in the right direction, because it will make you a lot sharper. The adrenaline is definitely pumping. And if you can control your nerves, I think you can go out to the field being really sharp. What preparation are you going to do now, just before you go in? Well, I like to get out and have a look at the, what the bowlers are doing, uh, see the state of the ball, see if it's swinging or not. Uh, we're quite fortunate we've got the television, so we can look at the replays in the change room and just see where the fielders are, where the better fielders are, if the guy's left-handed or right-handed, where the singles are, and if we're scoring in a one-day game, where we're scoring, where we aren't scoring. So by the time I get out there, hopefully I've got a game plan ready. Yeah, on the way to the wicket, any, uh, any tips for the boys? Well, I like to get my feet moving. Um, you know, it's, it's quite important that the first ball you face, it, you know, the bowler obviously wants to get in the right place, and you want to be ready for it. And if your feet aren't moving, if, you, if you're a little bit nervous and you're tentative, you tend to stiffen up a bit, and then your feet don't move. And I think in cricket, uh, I like to run a bit in the spot before I get out to the wicket. I might look a bit like a prancing horse, but by the time I get there, my feet are moving and my adrenaline is flowing in the right direction. When you've got to the wicket, you're taking guard. What do you do now? I mean, Well, I want the bowler to bowl at me. You know, I want to make it easy for myself as possible. And if I start playing shots outside the off stump, the bowler's got more of a chance to get me out. So I like to know where my off stump is. I take my guard and also mark where my off stump is and just try and score my runs off the body and mainly on the leg side. You know, if, if he bowls me a, a half volley on off stump, I'm going to obviously drive it. But initially, for the first sort of half an hour of my innings, unless it's a one-day game, the situation calls for otherwise, I'm going to play as straight as possible and just make sure I play down the line of the ball. Well, you've got to 30. <laughs> OK, <laughs> you've got to 30, and, and now the pressure's off you a little bit. Um, how do you keep your concentration going? Well, I think it's, it's really still it's very important. I mean, you just one slip up and you're out again. And... In five-day cricket especially, in first-class cricket, 30s and 40s, we've, we've learnt now that's just not good enough for anyone. And you've got to keep treating each ball as it comes. I think the biggest mistake you start doing once you've got 30 or 40 is premeditating a shot. You know, you think, well, if he, if he bowls it here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it. Well, the next ball, I'm going to play it to leg side, or I'm going to sweep it. Um, I'm going to sweep it for four, rather than just be play each ball on its merits. So I think it's important that you remain focused on each ball, you remain focused on each bowler as well. You know, if, especially if you've got to 30, you probably have one or two bowling changes. Um, you've got to get to know what each bowler is doing and you know, make sure you've, you've worked out the pitchers, how the pitcher is playing. When you've, um, some batsmen that I've talked to um, like to go up in tens, do you use that method at all? I like to use that in a partnership, not for myself in tens, but batting with the other guy. Right. You know, I just find if you're setting a total, you can say, OK, we're going to score 100. You know, that's quite a, it's, quite daunt it's quite a daunting sort of task. And between the two of you, if you're scoring at tens, between the two of you, I could score one and he might score two boundaries and a one and we've got 10, so it takes the pressure off me. Whereas if I'm thinking I must score 10s, you know, then if I, if I go with a few overs without scoring, then I'm putting myself under a bit of pressure. But as, if we're doing the 10s together, I do find it takes the pressure off both batsmen, because if I have a good over and he has a bad over, at least we're still sticking to our task. You got to 50. Is that a, is that a <laughs> danger period for you? 
a sort of a relief period, or are you looking to sort of go on from there? It is a relief, but I also think you, I think the biggest danger area is about 60 or 70, because after 50, you always get told to start again, and you do, you do tend to start again, and you, you know, you basically, you're playing as correctly as possible from 50 to 60, but once you're on 60, you think, well, I'm away, and you play a few more shots than you would, say, between 20 and 30. So by, by getting to 70, that for me is a danger period, between 70 and 100, because Straight after 50, I tend to start again and do concentrate for the next 10 or 15 runs. But then after that, I, I get a bit loose. So it'd be quite important then, once you get to that danger period, or you recognise that danger period, that maybe you should take guard again, have a look at the field again, compose yourself, get ready again. Would you agree with that? I think it'd be really useful. Um, you know, people talk about 50s and 100s, but I think you can even break it down, like you say, into a danger period, which for me is, is between sort of 60 and 70. So if I can break that down and start again and keep going in the 10s, instead of looking for the 100 or, or the 50 and, and being a bit loose. Now you're playing test match cricket, you've got to 120. What are your targets now? You know, I still think it's really important. Um, test cricket is really hard. You can get, get some really top bowlers, you can get a bad decision, you can play a bad shot. And if it's your day, if you get to 120, you've actually got to make it really big. Because there could be a batsman coming in, you, you could think, well, we're 300 for three, and I'm on 120, I've done my job. But the next three or four batsmen might get either a good delivery or a bad decision. And if it's your day, you've got to make it count. I think that the better test players we've seen and have played against have scored really big hundreds against us. And we know what it's like when a chap scores 170. That's making it big. Rather than 110 or 113 or 120, if it's your day, you've really got to go right through and score over 150. That's really good advice from a really good test cricketer. And uh, all of you who listen to that, you know, it's important to build an innings and work hard on it. As a cricket coach, I think it's very important that you make your job enjoyable as well as the people you're teaching enjoyable. And to do that, you need to plan your coaching carefully. And what I've done is used here a cricket coaching school term planner to get you through a school term season. For example, in a school term, you might have nine weeks in which you're going to coach cricket. Therefore, I think each practice should include a skill. For example, in week one, you might teach the bowling, the action, and the grips. Each session should last two hours plus, and if it's very hot, maybe you have to cut that down. You break down the whole week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you use different age groups, under 13s and under 14s, or if you're in a primary school, under 9s and under 10s. So you're actually breaking down each age group and coaching from Monday to Thursday. On a Friday, you change it slightly, bring in all the age groups with their respective coaches if you've got enough, and you teach them field placings, fielding games, tactics, the art of captaincy, the rules of the game, umpiring, video instruction, and individual coaching, whatever you as coach feel is necessary for that particular team. Now, over the nine weeks, it's important to try and cover the majority of things that you deal with in cricket. So I've given a rough program here. You don't have to follow this. You can make your own program up. The grip stance and back lift in week two. I always like to start with bowling in week one, mind you, because it helps because when you have nets after that, at least the guys can bowl reasonably straight. The forward defensive in week three. Remember, you don't want to get out too often, otherwise you won't be batting in the middle. Backward defensive and glides. The drives, hitting over the top sweeps and cuts, and the hooks and pulls. And maybe in the ninth week, you have a little barbecue or braai just to increase the team spirit. Um, you might give a prize to the most improved player, or you might revise the whole lot, depending whether you've got another term of cricket after the one you've just had. So it's very important, as you can see, to build up the skills of all your charges so that when they go into the matches, they're adequately prepared. When organising any practice, remember that the structure is important. First, practice one skill for at least 10 minutes. Secondly, ensure each group knows what they have to do and the skill they are learning. Thirdly, progress from the skill into a game situation but without pressure. Fourthly, now include the pressure situation. Finally, the duty of a